<laughs> this morning, we continue with part two of Habakkuk. And it is titled, Walking by Faith, this morning. How many of you understand this morning that walking by faith is a challenge? Okay, only a couple. That's good. Walking by faith is a very difficult thing to do. The reason being is because it requires the very simple thing called faith. Why is faith so hard? I'm looking for some answers from this church because only two or three people raised their hand on that question. Now, maybe I should, re re maybe I should read that question back to you one more time. How many find walking by faith is difficult? Okay. How many find walking by faith, and don't get me wrong, you can raise your hand on this because I'm, then the next question might be geared towards you. How many find walking by faith is easy? If that's like you, I see one brother back there, a couple up front here, run there. Don't be afraid to raise your hand because, you know, as we remember, faith is what? It is something that can be increased. Faith can be something that can grow. Faith can be something that can be multiplied. Okay? So each one is given a measure of faith, the Bible says. And so we understand that by the fact that some have great faith and some have small faith. It only takes a little bit of faith to do anything. Okay? Here's the thing. When we have great faith, it makes our everyday life so much easier because every situation in our past, in our history, we have said, God, this is in your hands. What do you want me to do? We, we say these words. It may not be the exact same words I say. I say, God, it's in your hands. I have faith in you. What do you want me to do? And God says, uh, I want you to do this, this, and this. And go, Ooh, that's hard. Okay, let's do it. And it gets a little easier, a little easier. I may, you know, I'm hesitant to say that it's easy to walk by faith, but I want to say that it is easier to walk by faith than to not walk by faith. Let me say that again. It is easier for me, a believer, to walk by faith than it is a believer to not walk by faith. Why? Because when I don't walk by faith, I know that there are consequences that are attached to that. Anytime I do not walk by faith, I align myself with disaster. I align myself with destruction. And we're going to talk about that this morning. We don't realize that every time we do not exercise faith, we align ourselves with the opportunity for destruction to happen in our lives. And to me, I would rather live through a hard situation to be stuck in a bad situation. Amen? We left Habakkuk somewhere last week in a location in Israel, in Jerusalem. Habakkuk was waiting on a response from God. Habakkuk had asked two questions of God. God had responded once already. We, re, uh, we, we recap just a little bit of some of the things that Habakkuk is going through. Imminent destruction and chastisation by God of all of Judah. Israel has, the second half of the kingdom has already fallen into Assyrian captivity. Now Judah is left. Remember, Judah is the other half of that nation that actually had a few more good kings than Israel did. In fact, they had zero. Okay. Israel didn't have any good kings after Solomon. When this nation split, that was it. They just went into e just dumb stuff. And they went into captivity earlier than Judah because Judah actually had kings that did right in the eyes of God. That tells me that God is long-suffering. Say amen. Man, I can't, I'll tell you what. I don't know who it was. 
I think it was Elise was talking to me or somebody was talking to me about uh, being in, um, uh, going, I used to go to, my mom would take me to Southern Gospel black churches. I loved them. I'll tell you what, there's more fire sometimes. And I, and I, I think back of that. She reminded me of that, and I was sitting there thinking, man, we got we to gotta get some of these people back to that kind of, uh, of sermon because w- when you start speaking out there, and the, uh, uh, all of a sudden the Spirit of God gets, hey, man, I, I feel that. I, I feel those people getting loud. They're getting excited. So we might have to do that this morning. Amen? Amen. Woo! I'm telling you. Habakkuk had not heard from God in many years. The people of Israel and Judah, period, had not heard from God. The word of God had not come to them through a prophet in a long time. The armies of Babylon, the Chaldeans, the Persians, and the Medes were on the march. They were destroying every city they came in contact with and scooping up the people that were what they wanted, the strong, the smart, the intelligent, the good-looking. And they were swooping them up, and they were taking them back to their land in Babylon. And they were building an empire. Their worship wasn't a, a god or a statue. Their worship of their gods was towards this great multitude of people that they were harvesting from the earth. And here Habakkuk has heard the marches of the enemy as they have marched on to wipe out the last controlling area of Egypt just to the north. Okay, And they had seen this army and they knew that it was only a matter of time before that army, after they had victor- victory over Egypt, who was the powerhouse, now The Medes, the Persians, and the Babylonians became the super powerhouse in all the world, and they wiped out Egypt, and it was only a matter of time before they came by, wiped out Judah, and carried them off. Habakkuk said, listen, we can't be wiped out because there is a promise from God to Abraham that we stand on, that we are going to reign with him, that we are the children of God, that we won't be wiped out. And so he had this promise in his first address to God. God responded. Now, God's response in chapter 5 is quite different than Habakkuk's response to God in verse 2. But it does give us an understanding that the works of God that he was about to do were strange. In fact, God says, look among the nations, verse 5, chapter 1 of Habakkuk, look among the nations and watch, be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe. God was about to do something in Judah's life that no one would believe. Habakkuk knew exactly what that was. Judgment on a wicked people. But what Habakkuk wanted to know even deeper was what God planned to do with those few righteous people. We left Habakkuk sitting, laying, standing on a wall in Jerusalem. Verse 1, chapter 2. We read it last week. We closed with it. Verse 1 says, I will stand my watch and set myself on a rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. What humility. What humility. As we get ready to go into chapter 2, we're going to read verse 2 down through verse 4. Uh, actually, I'm going to stop. I, I, I take that back. I'm going to actually stop at verse 2. I'm going to end it at that verse 2, and we're going to, we'll carry on from there in just a second. Listen to the response 
of God. I love this. This is, I'll tell you what, when I read this, and I, 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 I broke several times when I read this. I was just sharing uh, this morning with some people when I first got this message a couple months ago. It was in the woods, and I had this study. And as I read these words here, I literally broke because I, I understand what God was saying and how catastrophic the situation began. Let's read it together and I'll explain it. Verse 2, Then the Lord said to me, the Lord answered Habakkuk. He says, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Run. God's answer to Habakkuk's question is run. Not fight. Not take up arms. Not blow a trumpet in Zion. Get ready for battle. He says flee. Not only that, he says write it down on stone. I want this to be permanent. Back then, Habakkuk would normally write it on a parchment. He would probably then from there transpose it as the, uh, the Levitic Levites within the temple would do. There were some that were set aside for carving out stone, some that were set aside for writing on parchments. He says, take this one. I want you to make it permanent. Chapter 2 is the contingency plan for this judgment that is getting ready to happen on God's people. We'll get into it here in a little bit because uh, the rest of the chapter after we get past verse 4 is telling them what to expect and what to get ready for when they go into captivity. But I want you to look at this verse 2. He now says to flee, to run. You know, I've started thinking about it. There's only a couple other instances where this type of attitude or this type of situation, I shouldn't say attitude, but this type of situation occurred already twice in the Bible. The first one was Noah. All were doing evil. There was a small remnant of righteousness, and God judged the people. And what did he do? He provided a way of escape for them to flee through the ark. Did they not? Amen? Oh, almost there. It was a little bit quieter than the last amen. We'll try better. The second time was Sodom and Gomorrah. God came down to judge and destroy, and he provided a way of escape. For the righteous to do what? Run, flee, as hellfire and brimstone, fire is destroying the unrighteous, judgment is coming down, the righteous are escaping by the protection of God. Here, God is bringing judgment on all of Judah. He's going to wipe them out. He's going to send them into captivity as well, but he's going to provide a way of escape for them. Habakkuk needs to hear that. Right now, he's on the edge. That's why he's on the rooftop. He is waiting. God, that was a great answer. The first thing you told me was uh, uh, in verses 5 down through verse 11, we see God's response in the first time, but it was mainly addressing the fact that, yes, I am doing a work here that you wouldn't believe, and it's called... Judgment through the Chaldeans, which are an evil people. And Habakkuk didn't necessarily like that, that an evil nation would judge a lesser evil nation. That was his argument, kind of. All right? All right, let's move on because we, we're going to get down here to verse 4. I'm going to read 3 and 4 together here. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But 
but the just shall live by faith. Three chapters. Each chapter, we got 17, I got 20 on the next one, and quite a bit more on the third chapter of Habakkuk. This sliver of a verse, it's not even a whole verse, it's a half a verse, is all God gives for hope. It is so important, it is quoted. Romans 117, chapter 1, verse 17. For, it, for in it the righteous of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul wrote that to the Roman Christians, whether they were Jews or Gentiles. Galatians 3.11 says, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, as this is where we are this morning as a people. Do you realize that there is a judgment yet still to come on this earth? Another judgment that we don't want to be counted with them that are being judged. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm actually going to back up to verse 26. And I want us to read this because I believe that God is sending us some very good information that might pertain to our future. For if we sin, excuse me, 38. I actually want to start in verse 34. Let's come down. 34. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plunder of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourself. Where? In heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has, a great, which has great reward, for you have need of of endurance so that you so that after you have done the will of God you may receive the promise for yet a little while and he who is coming will come and you will not and and will not tarry now the just shall live by faith but if anyone draws back my soul has no pleasure in him Sodom and Gomorrah did anybody drop the uh, draw back so did Lot's wife not draw back? God's soul did not have any pleasure in that. Guess what? Today, God still doesn't have any pleasure in those that are drawing back. In, pre, in Peter, it says that God will draw near to us if we do what? The Bible says that God will draw near to us if we... Pretty good. God said He will draw near to us if we draw near to Him. I don't know if you understand what that means. Drawing near to God. This is, this is all that God wanted from the beginning. Garden of Eden. Did not God not want Adam and Eve to draw near to him? Uh, Abraham. Did Abraham draw near to God? Absolutely. How about the burning bit, bush? God didn't draw near to, uh, to, to, oh, excuse me, to Moses, did he? No, Moses drew near to the burning bush. God is looking for us to show the initiative to draw near to Him, to make a conscious decision to say, I want to be close to you to understand what's going on. Habakkuk knew that. Habakkuk set himself aside. He purified himself. He says, I've got to draw near to God to get 
his attention to find out what is going on. When I look at this verse in, in, uh, in Hebrews, and I think about this, I realize that we, too, are living in a time where the just shall live by faith. And in that, we are set before us a choice that if we want to, we can escape the very destruction of anything that happens on this earth. Now, Peter is as much, uh, you know, Peter's kind of special. Peter's one of those disciples that he got, uh, he got a little bit more than he, bit, uh, he, than he bargained for when he became an apostle. Peter was one of those individuals that many of us uh, uh, really feel like we're kind of close to him because well, he messed up a little bit once in a while. But yet he turned around and he became one of the greatest apostles. He was one of the three closest to Jesus. Okay? And he knew something that many of them knew, but he knew it to a different degree. Verse 13 of chapter 3 of 1 Peter gets me a little bit here. So verse 13 and verse 14. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Now, going back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk is now receiving a vision. And God is telling him, to take this vision and put it on stone and let the people know that this, what you're receiving now, is needing to be carried into Babylonian captivity. It is the hard print or the blueprint for how you are going to survive this catastrophic event to you. Now, I don't know if you guys have got an imagination like I do, and mine's very vivid. When I think, and I explained this to you last week, when I think about what it must have been like to see the approach of a foreign government coming to uproot me and take me away, and not just me, but only a certain selected few people, the rest of them, you know what happened to the rest of them? Anybody? They were killed. The only ones that weren't killed, necessarily, if you go back, if you were with us on Sunday evening last week, the only ones that weren't killed, that weren't taken into captivity, were the extremely poor farmers that worked the land. They were left behind. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar the, the second was the one that was invading. He was the leader of the Chaldeans, the Medes, the Persians, and the Babylonians. He came in to Judah Wiped them out. Collected with their net, which we just read in chapter 1. Collected them with their net, which is not a real net. Come on. What they call the net. And they brought them in, only the selected people, and they were carried off. Now, some of you might say, oh, they were carried off in chains. They were carried off in whack. No, they weren't. It wasn't anything like that. They had nowhere to go. Everything was destroyed. And basically, they said... Everybody that we have selected, you show up basically at this time. This is the convoy that's going 900 miles to um, Iraq, Babylon. Nine, 900 miles away, we're all going to get together and we're going to march and you're going to become our new slaves. So take whatever you can, put it on a wagon, on a horse, on a donkey, put it on your back, I don't care. You better be here and if we find anybody else that didn't show up, we're going to just kill you. No one's fleeing. Everybody's going with us. That's what they were faced with. Their whole lives changed. Their home that they had, their, 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 all their scripture that they had on their walls, in their kitchen, like you do at your home, it's all gone. You know that beautiful, pure sheep that you've been caping in the backyard waiting for that day when you know, one of your kids sins really bad. Oh, let's go get the sheep. We've got to go get that. Then cleanse you. All that's gone. Everything's gone. 
Put yourself in their perspective. How many years they've been there, triumphant, victorious over their enemies, seeing miracles, being in the land where King David, King Solomon, Samuel, the prophets, all these things, great works of God, only to find that God is raining down judgment like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah, to be associated with the same judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, the same judgment of Noah and the flood. God looked down and he said, I'm not pleased. Yeah, well, Habakkuk wasn't pleased either. We, we know that. But we go back and we read as, as God begins to reveal his plan to Habakkuk. In verse 4, he leaves this little sliver, but the just shall live by faith. Now, the reason I stop there is because as we get ready to move forward, he changes how he is addressing uh, Habakkuk. Now he's going to give, from that moment there, the just shall live by faith, he's going to give them information about the future of what's going on, and he's also going to give them information on what to watch for, what to not lay hold of or to bow down to. Because remember, right now, it's the Chaldeans, the Medes, the Persians, and in Babylon, it's the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, that is in charge. Now, they didn't have necessarily any statues or whatever for them to worship. They worshipped, basically, their harvest of people. We understand that when you read chapter 1. But that's not always the case. How many remember in the book of Daniel, the writing on the wall? I mentioned it last week. The writing on the wall, the hand of Jesus, across from the lampstand, wrote, Many, many tinkle you farson, which means you've been tried and weighed and found wanting. You did not take care of my people like I asked you to. Well, I don't know if he asked him to or not, but he did not take care of his, his prized people. And so now God's going to rain judgment in the book of Daniel down on Nebuchadnezzar's son. Nebuchadnezzar did right in the eyes of God after he had put Daniel in the, in the lion's den, or actually after he had re interpreted the dreams. He said, from here on forward, Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, I make a decree, everybody's going to worship Daniel's God, the Most High God. Great. Good. He turned and he became righteous in that form. The second thing was he had a son that did evil in the eyes of God. He did such evil that God talks about it. Let's read. Verse 5. Indeed, because he transgressed by wine, he is a proud man. And he does not stay at home. Why does he not stay at home? Because he's continuing to conquer the world by collecting people and bring them in. How did he transgress by wine? You've got to go back and you have to read in Daniel chapter 5, verse 27 to understand how he transgressed by wine. Because he enlarges his uh, desire as hell, as Sheol, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nation and heaps up for himself all people. This is a woe from God being extended to Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? This is a warning to the people, too, to say, hey, watch for this to happen. Okay? So what happened was Nebuchadnezzar that invaded Judah collected up all of the, the tabernacle's articles, all the holy things. We already know that we, we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the golden lampstand, the brazen labor, the altar of sacrifice, and whatever else that they thought was worth anything. They collected it, brought it back to Babylon. Years after Nebuchadnezzar, Babel, Belshazzar comes in, he sets up his kingdom, and he brings all those articles into their palace. And thousands of all the nobles and leaders sat down to have a drunken orgy with God's holy instruments. At that time, the hand of God, Jesus, writes on the wall, that's enough. Tonight, you're going to be overthrown. 
And that night, the Assyrians and the Medes came in, and they, not the Assyrians, the Medes came in, and the Persians came in, and they wiped them out. And they set up their kingdom. Um, the Persians, at that time, they were into statues. Okay, so they set up a giant statue with different kinds of metal, gold, silver, clay, and it was all taken from all of the stuff that they had stolen from all these other nations. They made this giant statue. You remember that? Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down. You want to know why? Let's read. Verse 6. Will not all these take up a proverb against him? This is talking about the people that they have collected. Take up a, pro a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Daniel chapter 6, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 5, 27. In one night, God said, you've been tried and weighed, and I'm your creditor, and you've been found wanting, and that night he was overthrown in one night. Verse 7, continue. Will they not uh, awaken who oppress you, and you who become their booty or treasure, because you have plundered many nations, all, that all the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood. And the violence of the land and the, of, and the city and all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house. Okay, back to Daniel again. Did he not covet all of those articles? Okay that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the powers of disaster. No, it ain't going to happen. You gave shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall. I love it. I don't know if you guys caught that or not, but I love it. Psalms. 118.22, turn with me real quick there. Psalms 118.22. Everybody there? Oh, there's no 22 in 118. What am I saying here? Psalms 1, I'm not even 118, that's why. There is a 22. Verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You see, the purpose behind the protection of God's people, the remnant, is this. He is protecting the seed of Abraham. The most important thing in our life today was being carried within the bodies, the human bodies, of the Israelites. Generation to generation to generation to generation had been carrying the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. This is what the prophets knew. The prophets knew that they could not be wiped out to extinction because God had within them the salvation of the world at hand within their human bodies. The cornerstone. Verse 11 says, For the stone will cry out from the wall. Jesus will not be oppressed. And then it says, I love this, it says, Then the beam from the timber will answer it. Woe to him. Now, he didn't say column. He didn't say floorboard. He said beam. Now, if you, are, if you know anything about um, building materials, you will know that a beam is the very thing that carries your protection overhead. That beam, everything hinges on that beam of protection from all elements that come down, whether it be rain, whether it be snow, whether it be a wind or whatever, that beam is set there for the purpose of covering and protecting 
This is what's being said here. It says, the beam and the beam from the timber will answer it. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire, and nations weary themselves in vain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him or uh, him to your bottle. Pressing, or in other words, adjoining him or uh, attaching him, okay, to your bottle. Even, if, even to make him drink, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink, and he exposed as, uh, and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunders of beasts which made them afraid, because the men, of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city, and all and of all who dwell in it. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, and molded image a the molded image a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says, Wood awake awake. To the silent stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. No wonder Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow one knee because they had read the stones about the idols made with gold and silver and wood. And here it was, years after they had taken, were taken out of Judah, here they were standing in this awesome arena, huge, miles and miles wide, hundreds of thousands of people gathered to come and see this giant statue that the Persians, after they had taken over Babylon, had erected this massive idol. And can you imagine that moment in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's eyes, in their minds, as they remember the vision of God, what was written on that stone, as they looked at this and they were told, if you do not bow down to this image, this God, we're going to put you into the fiery furnace. Little did they know that the stone out of the wall was going to be with them and the beam was going to cover them the whole time. I want to pause because I want to get back to the, some of the things that we've, we've been talking about and the whole scope of this is walking by faith. How difficult sometimes it is to walk by faith. These people, our brothers, our sisters, left their homeland with stones telling about their future. And I don't know if they had a way of underlining or highlighting on that stone, but I imagine they put special emphasis around that little area that said, the just shall live by faith. And I guarantee you, when the word of the Lord, word of God was spoken from Habakkuk to all those people, many repented. Because they wanted to be counted with the righteous. They wanted to be counted with those that were going to be protected during this time. Many of us saw that very same thing. Uh, and we have seen that. Look at 9-11. We've seen when, when, when certain catastrophic events happen. The stone tablets in the heart of mankind today, which house the truths of God, written here, all of a sudden popped up and people that have known the truth in past reread those stone tablets and said, I'm going back to church. I'm repenting. How many remember that in 
uh, after the 9-11 attacks. You know why that has happened? It's great. It's good because uh, we see in Romans, I'm going to have to check me on that one, but I'm pretty sure it's Romans. It might be Hebrews now that I think about it. It says that the Gentiles not having a law are a law unto themselves because they have the law written on the tablets of their heart. You see, that's what happens to us. We are reminded of the promises of God. When dire situations happen, we're reminded of them. When 9-11 hit, all those that were not paying attention, all those that were not in church, that were not uh, walking uh, by the Spirit, were instantly checked in the Spirit, and the law of their heart that God had written long ago popped out. They reread it and said, oh, yeah, I need to get right. And they got into the church, and they started to walk again by the Spirit. But many drew back because they're not here. At least they're not here in this church. They might be somebody else, somewhere else. But they drew back. You see, this is the disease that I want to talk to you about this morning. When it comes to walking by faith, it is drawing back, drawing our hand back, drawing our foot back, drawing our mouth back, drawing our ears back. God is constantly saying, if you have ears, hear. If you have eyes, see. But if we have already drawn back, we're no longer looking or seeing. It is only when we draw near that we see the burning bush. It catches our attention. That's interesting. Never seen that in the desert before. But I draw away. No, I draw near. I investigate. There's something different here. And I draw near the burning bush. And God draws near and says, take off your sandal, this is holy ground, let's have a conversation, I need some work out of you, be obedient, do what I tell you to do. I like that, that's how I operate with God. He's like my CO. I called you in here, I got a mission for you, I need you to get this done, this, this, and this done. Whoa, I'm out of here, moving. I think that's a good, I, I think that, that that's all I need to know. Moses drew near, drew near to the burning bush, he received instructions, he moved out to fulfill them. Contrary to the Christians today, we draw near to God, we hear the instructions, we count the cost. Eh, it's a little too much. How about I just sit here in a pew and just say I'm a Christian? Isn't that good enough? I'm in church. I say I'm a Christian. I, I even put scripture above my doors and on my refrigerator. Whoa. You know how they drew near to God? You know how these people drew near to God? They pulled those tablets out and they reminded themselves that the just shall live by faith. That the just shall live by faith. There was another man in history named Martin Luther. Many of you are familiar with him. He spurred on much of our church during, uh, this was long ago, long, long, long time ago. But he stirred, he, he at one point was part of the Catholicism, and he had read here in these scriptures in the New Testament, and then also went back to Habakkuk, and he had read that the just shall live by faith. And it stuck in his mind. He goes, wait a minute. You're telling me that I don't have to go to a priest I don't have to uh, uh, go and take of their communion or, or whatever they're doing. I don't have to. It says that the just shall live by faith, faith alone. I could be anywhere, and I can live forever, for you have eternity to live with God if I just live by faith. And Martin Luther had a, re a revelation, and he took a, and wrote a thesis, and he nailed it, his 95th thesis, to the Catholic Roman Church door, and he separated. And now we know them as what? The Lutherans. Nothing wrong with them. But that's us. We are those that live by faith. Now, 
How hard is that again? Many of you raised your hands. Walking by faith is difficult. Put yourself in their shoes for just a moment. Their moccasins, their sandals, I don't know what they wore. Put yourself in their shoes for a moment. They left everything. How hopeless that must have seemed. How many of their loved ones got slaughtered in their hometowns? How many of them died possibly of hunger, starvation? Do you think they were prepared to feed all of those millions of people that they collected? No. They said, here's some land, cultivate it, live here, feed yourselves, and you're our slaves, by the way. God said, you're going to live. You're going to live, but you've got to have faith. You've got to have faith or faith. This morning, today, many of you are walking by faith. Some of you are walking good, strong by faith. But some of you are struggling with faith because of one small thing. We're still using the wrong eyes. And I'm going to give you an example here in just a second. You're still using the wrong eyes. You have drawn back instead of drawing near to God, because you, when you draw near to God, you do it out of faith. And you can't use your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears without faith. But instead, we use our natural eyes and our natural ears, and we are overwhelmed, or at least concerned, for what we see. Just as Habakkuk and many other of God's people were overwhelmed with what they saw, by the Chaldean war party. They were overwhelmed with what they saw. And many of them fled, tried to escape, and were only hunted down and murdered, killed. But then there were those that read the words, Run, flee, and let me protect you. You see, there's a family that I spoke with Friday. And about a week prior to that, they had received some very heart-wrenching news. It was a Thursday before last Friday. And they called me immediately, and we began to pray. And I saw them that Friday, and I, when I saw them in the morning, they were all in tears. Their countenance was probably similar to what you might have saw um, with the people of Judah, as the, as the Chaldeans were coming in. It was very sad, tears. They were overwhelmed. And we begin. I said, if I'm coming tomorrow, we're praying only. That's all we're going to do is we're going to pray, and we're going to go to God just like Habakkuk did, and we're going to get an answer. And something special happened one week later. As my spiritual eyes caught something, as God spoke to my heart, as I began to sit with them, And he says, look at them. They're smiling. They're playing with their child. Their countenance was different. And I go, wow. That was a trial. It was just a small trial. It was a trial. And we turned to God, and we used faith, and he caused joy to happen in the morning. You're 100% different than you were last Thursday and Friday. You're happy. You're excited. You have come through the fiery furnace on one occasion. We still have more trials to go. This is a lesson to learn. When you walk by faith, anytime you turn to God in any situation and you ask God's help, however crazy He might want to solve your problem, to us it's crazy. To him it's perfect. And you do it, you need to start looking for the evidence. The outward evidence of God's work. It may be as simple as getting an extra hour of sleep. It may be as simple as someone coming over and bringing you a meal at that right time. 
That's evidence of your faith. God said he'd take care of you, did he not? When that meal comes, did he take care of you? Amen, because people are praying. Anytime you consult God, don't just consult him and not believe that he will do something. Believe that he is going to do something. It may not be what you think. What did God say? I got to read it again. This cracks me up. Let's go back to Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. And these are the words that God may say to you one day when you're looking for an answer from God in your trial, your situation. And God says, look among this city of Eugene. Look among this state of Oregon. Look among this nation of the U.S. And watch and be totally amazed. For I will, I will work a work in your day which you would not believe though it were told you. You know, when God says that to you, just go, okay, let's do it. Why? Because it's not going to be what you think. You know what we envision? You know what we envision? We envision miraculous things like walking into a fiery furnace and not having any smoke touch us or fire harm us. We envision grand things and we forget the one small thing that he can do easily, and that's just provide a simple meal for you. Provide you with an extra couple hours of sleep. Why? Because we forget how blessed we really are. And we look up, and we see this house that's still standing. We see our children still being fed. We still have an air conditioner and a heater, some of us. We still have money in our banks. We still have a vehicle, gas. We have all of this. The Israelites had none of it. And we're still looking for a miracle? We are a miracle. God cares about your situation, but he needs you to walk by faith because that's how we live. And it's not just, when we think about living we don't just think about, li this isn't to kind of live like what you're thinking your everyday, day-to-day -day life. Jesus, God, is life. Jesus was in the Garden of Eden as the tree of life. And you know who ate of the tree of life? Adam and Eve. Uh, and they were told they could eat of that tree. They said, eat of this tree. It's good. Don't eat of that tree. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Blessings and curses were laid before Israel and Judah. Eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eat of the tree of life. Today, you are offered the same thing. You can continue to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know what that is? That's anything that's contrary to faith, anything contrary to the Spirit of God. That's the spirit of the world. Anytime you turn back and you put your trust and faith in things of the world, you're eating of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You want to eat of the tree of life? You will draw near to God, and God will write on your tablets of your heart the things that He wants you to do. He will remind you of the things that He has already given you and blessed you with, and He will continue to be that covering over you and your family so long as you live. He will always provide you with a way of escape. He will always be concerned for your safety and your well-being, but He will always challenge you to do work no matter how old you are. Pillars. I see a lot of pillars in this church. What has God asked you to do lately for this body? Don't hold back. Don't hold back doing things for God. It is the small things of faith. It is that, yes, Lord, now that I've received the information, I will write it on the stone tablets, and we will prepare to run. 
I think it's only fitting that I remind you that Paul calls us to run. Paul calls, calls us to run the race of faith. And this morning, that is us, faith runners, carrying within this vessel, carrying within this vessel the seeds of righteousness, the seeds of godliness, the seeds of love. And with those seeds, he's asking you to go and plant them in individuals. As I looked at my newborn grandson, I watched and realized that the faith that is in me, that is now in my daughter, that is in my son-in-law, has now been passed down to my grandson. Instantly like that. Instantly. And I know this because of the book of Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 1. Paul, addressing Timothy, says, I am convinced that the same faith that is in your grandmother and your mother, I am convinced, is in you as well. Faith, walking by faith, is superimposed on your children, is superimposed on your church and on your people in the church. And this is why I ask, the pillars of this church, the individuals of this church, to recognize that you are called to multiply, to begin to exercise our faith by what you do for the body of Christ. What you do in your family, and don't hide it. If no one would have ever seen, if they had had the fiery furnace somewhere long, uh, hidden, that no one else could see, no one told the story. We never saw it. We didn't get to see the evidence. It wouldn't be in the Bible, more than likely, because nobody would have got to see what happened, what God did. How many of us are holding back the testimonies of God this morning? How many of us are holding back from doing the will of God this morning? How many of us have drawn back? And God has no pleasure in that, he says. God has no pleasure. God has no pleasure in drawing back. You know what he has pleasure in? Faith. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 1. Somebody see if that's right. It is impossible to please God without faith. This morning I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready to take of our morning tithes and offering. I'm going to ask also that our worship team come back this morning. I would like to continue this sermon into our time of taking of communion. Again, something that is etched into our hearts, that Jesus carved into our hearts. He says, this do in remembrance of me. This do in remembrance of me. God has asked you this morning to remember. There's something that requires faith here, people. God doesn't just say, write this down. God doesn't just put things on uh, uh, in our minds to say, hey, remember this for no reason. Anything, anytime he asks us to remember something like this, he is saying, I want you to use faith. We're going to take communion, and guess what? It's going to require faith. How? How is taking communion requiring any faith this morning? Because Jesus says you must believe. You must believe. All those, all those corpses that fell in the wilderness died because of Come on, people. Do you not read your Bibles? Because of unbelief. Go ahead, Brother Mike. Hebrews tells us that they all fell because of unbelief, because of disobedience. This morning I'm asking you, 
This is why there's this is why Paul, the Apostle Paul, gives a little bit of a warning in taking communion. Don't take it in an unworthy manner. The worthy manner is to take it in faith this morning. Take it and believe this morning. Take it and remember your blessed hope this morning. Don't just take it as some little tiny piece of bread and grape juice. Take it and understand the importance of why he said, remember this. Write this down. My blood, my body have a significant purpose. You want to know what it is? It is the new ark. It is the very vessel that will carry you away from judgment. This is what the the writer in Hebrews was alluding to. Every one of those scriptures, if you go back and you read Galatians 3.11, you go back and read Romans 1.17, you're going to see where Paul is talking about justification. The just shall live by faith. Go ahead, brother. He's saying to us in all those scriptures where he has quoted that, he is saying, guess what? We don't have any condemnation this morning. We have justification. Do this in remembrance out of faith to remind yourself that the just shall live by faith. That there is no condemnation this morning. Anything that you have done in your life, Anything that you have done this week, even this day, I pray not. Anything contrary that would align you with those that were in the wilderness, that perished because of unbelief, because of disobedience. This morning, you can have all of that completely cleansed, completely removed from your life. You can completely turn your life into a direction that shows that you are the remnant of Eugene. You are the remnant of Oregon. That you are the remnant of the church age, Laodicea, that is attributed as the lukewarm church. That God says, I will spew you out of my mouth, you that are lukewarm. But those of you that live by faith, you are just, and you will be rescued. You will be rescued. We will be rescued because of belief, because of obedience. This morning, I give you the first two chapters of Habakkuk. Next week, God willing, we probably won't get into the third chapter. I leave that for you to read on your own. But I would I encourage you to also go back, read Daniel, read 2 Kings, read Chronicles, the first Chronicles, read the stories that are surrounding Habakkuk why he is in his situation, why the people are in that situation. Because I tell you people, this morning we are in the same situation. We are in a world of corrupt, evil people. No president is going to save you. No congressman, no mayor, no governor, no policeman, no firefighter is going to save you the way the stone from the wall is going to save you. The just shall live by faith. Half of a scripture is extended to you this morning. One little scripture this morning is sent to you. The just shall live by faith. And this morning I challenge you, Before you take of communion this morning, ask God, God, am I walking by faith with you or are you dragging me? 
Are you standing afar, God, blazing with your burning bush, and I have yet to draw back near to you again? Am I standing out here doing my own thing? Or are you drawing near to the burning bush, to that holy ground? This morning, we're going to draw into that holy ground. We're going to go into the holy of holies by faith by a new and living way that is the body of Christ, the veil. You see, that's what this is about this morning. If you are the just, if you are that one that you can say, hey, that's me. I'm the one he's talking about. The just shall live by faith. That's me. Then that means not only are you calling yourself a Christian, but you're calling yourself the just. You're calling yourself a person that walks by faith. Bow your heads for just a moment. Father, I don't know that. I, I, only you can see to the deepest portals of a heart. Only you can test by fire a soul. Only you can mold clay into the shape that you wish to form it. Only you can preserve a vessel through the blood of Jesus Christ when there is destruction ready to happen. Only you are worthy of the title God. This morning as we get ready, I just pray, God, that the heart of the individual be examined this morning. That if there be anything in our lives that is displeasing, that God, you would first bring it to our attention and second, our humility would kick in and we would have a, a contrite spirit, a remorseful spirit, a regretful spirit that would say, Father, forgive me. I have not been living by faith, but I want to from here forward. Father, I have not been just in my words. I have not been just in my actions. I have not been living that life that I should be, forgive me. If that's you this morning, pray that this morning over your life right now quietly before we take communion. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you even know where you are? This morning, before we take of the bread, I'm going to ask Brother Bill if he would stand this morning and say a prayer over the bread. Before we take of the cup, before we take of the cup, is there anybody this morning? And I want you to think about this. And I don't, I'm not looking for a lengthy story. I just need a short, precise, God has been laying this on your heart. I need to see if there's anybody this morning that can testify to the faith and evidence of the faith that they have had this last week. The reason I'm asking you this as you think about that is because the evidence of the faith is what the church would get together every week to hear, to be encouraged with. The people would go out and they would do the work of God and it was miraculous. They were encouraged. They would go 
back to the church and they would say everything that had happened and they would rejoice and be glad. This morning, don't let, don't let the enemy close your mouth and not give praise and glory to God for the faith and evidence of your faith that happened this week. If that's you this morning, could you stand? If, there may be multiple of you, I don't know. Does anybody have? So we got two. Anybody else? Three. Anybody else? Don't let, don't let, you know what? God warns you. There's four. God warned us. He says, because they did not give him glory. Because they did not give them glory. Even though they knew God, he turned them over to a reprobate mind because why? They did not give him glory. There was a, there was a high priest that was killed. Why? Because he was not quick to give God glory. God is selfish for a good reason. This morning, there's five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this is what I want. I want it in one or two sentences. I prayed for this, and he did this for me. Nine. This is what I want. I want to hear from each of you. I prayed for this, or we prayed for this, and this happened. We'll start over here. Tell me. Praise God. Everybody give God a hand. Right here, at least. Um, I prayed for you, and God gave me no understanding, but I want him to go to the Jewish elder that day and then see you and I ask that um, in a prayer outburst and a proper lecture letter on the day of Nathan, you see the ugly of the hammer in your name. Praise God. Give God the glory. Go ahead. And, and you are, I was just going to say, and you are. Give God the glory this morning. <laughs> Brother Dave, in the back, tell me. Amen. Praise God. Let's give God the glory this morning. <laughs> Brother Bruce in the back. Grace of God. Amen, brother. The grace of God. Praise God. Give him the glory. <laughs> Sharon, or Shannon, sorry. Sharon, I will be coming. And you, and you, she brought her to your house, and what are you doing with that? And what I'm doing with that, I, I show everybody that godliness is the most important thing. All right. Amen. Give God the glory. Is this two separate ones? Yes, one for Kathy and one for Pastor Jesus. Okay, and evidence? Before we give praise to God, okay, now, is this the outcome that you thought was going to happen? Or did you think you were going to have to be hooked up to a machine or hooked up? I mean, prior to this, were they not saying that? Isn't that what we had heard, that you were going to have to probably have to have some kind of bag or whatever at one point? And, and you're in here today, and you are in the presence of God, and you are alive Give God the glory. You know, we just got to use the right eyeballs here, people. I look around here and I see smiles. 
All these things are evidence of the peace of God that passes all understanding. And the only way possible for any of this to happen is that you have been dipped in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why even if we forget to pray or we forget to include God, we've been dipped in the blood of Jesus, and that's why Brother Bruce, he's covered. That doesn't mean God says, hey, you know, I'd like to be included in that. But the fact that you give praise to God and glory to God, even though you didn't consult Him, but you see the works and the handiwork of God, that's what He's looking for. Okay, so the evidence of faith stood up this morning. All of us could stand up and say we're, we're all evidence of faith. But share it. Share it. I'm going to ask Sister Sharon if she would stand this morning and say a prayer over the cup this morning. Amen. Take, drink. Hallelujah. We're going to sing the strength of my life this morning. And if you would like to stand, would you stand with me this morning? If you need to sit, that's fine too. But I would love for you to stand with me this morning. As we sing this song, The Strength of My Life, the beginning of it is every day I look to you to be the strength of my life. You're the hope I hold on to be the strength of my life. And I started to think, you know, what perfect thing for the people of Judah as they walked those hundreds of miles to Babylon. I would be singing this, every day I look to you to be the strength to carry me through to this unknown land I've never been to, this foreign land. I trust you, be that strength in my life. This morning we are in a deprived nation. I don't care what you think. This nation is going the wrong direction. It's not nothing to do with the president or anything like that. It's got to do with the people. The people have forsaken God. But there's a remnant, praise God, that he says, guess what? The just shall live by faith. Now give me strength. Every day I look to you to be the strength yes. of my life. You're the hope I hold on to to be the strength of my life. Be the strength of my life. Be the strength of my life, be the strength of my life today. Oh, be the strength of my life, be the strength of my life, be the strength of my life today. Every day I look to you. Every day I look to you to be the strength. Of my life, breathe on me and make me new. Be the strength of my life, 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 of my life. today. Oh, be the strength of my life. Be the strength of my life, be the strength of my life today. Father, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. Lord, it is so good to know that you are concerned for our welfare. It is so good to know that you are our strong tower and our refuge and our way of escape when trouble arises. Teach us to run to you and not to mammon. Teach us to run to you and not to the world. 
to other things. Father, let us place our hope and our trust in you. Let us not forsake walking by faith. Lord, let us run the race worthy of a believer. We pray this this morning. And all God's people said, uh, let's try it again. And all God's people said, amen. all right, amen. You may be dismissed.